My favorite TV shows, man, the Sports Center, ESPN News, Pardon the Interruption, um, Around the Horn, um, quite frankly, um, Outside the Lines, uh, 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 Baseball Tonight. You know what I mean? I watch sports, dog. It's basically, that's what I'm trying to say. I watch sports, man. That's what I'm into. Sports, sports, sports. Every sport. Hockey, golf, basketball, football, of course. Baseball. You know what I mean? I got a favorite team, a favorite player in every single sport. I'm not going to answer those questions. Dog. Folks, thank you for tuning in today. If you're listening in, however you're listening in, thank you. And I hope you're enjoying your day so far. If you didn't know, you are listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University's student radio station. I am your host, Mr. Addison James Taylor. It's good to be with you folks, and it's good to hear you. I hope you can hear me as well. Whether you downloaded that Coastal Carolina University app or the TuneIn app, that's actually performing a little better right now. I appreciate you, and I hope you're having a blessed day. Before we start, I want to let everyone know and give a little quick, quick promo to everyone, just to let everyone know that my current job, Carolina Roadhouse, is having a yard slash bake sale this Saturday, April 4th, from 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. I'm going to say that again, folks. Carolina Roadhouse is having a yard slash bake sale this Saturday, April 4th, from 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. All proceeds, not some of the proceeds, not most of the proceeds, all of the proceeds, folks, will go to Relay for Life. That's Carolina Roadhouse, and the address for that is 4617 North Kings Highway, Myrtle Beach, or 48th Avenue. I'm going to say that one more time for you folks if you have some time on Saturday or even if you don't have time let's make some time this is something that um, us as a company and you know Miss Barbara has been doing for some time now she's been doing this for years now and it's a great great event and it's something to give back to so Carolina Roadhouse like I said is having a yard slash bake sale this Saturday April 4th 7 a.m. till till 10 p.m. I mean, excuse me till 10 a.m. and all proceeds will go to Relay for Life. Carolina Roadhouse 4617 North Kings Highway, Myrtle Beach. And on that note, folks, we're going to get you to the main topics of the day. What we usually give you a array of sports topics from a younger perspective, and that's what we're going to do. First, folks, I want to start with this play, and this play alone really generates a topic and a question that I've been frequently, frequently asked lately. If you saw some of the highlights from last night, you saw what Steph Curry did to Chris Paul when the Golden State Warriors played the Los Angeles Clippers last night. You know Chris Paul, maybe one of the best on-ball defensive point guards in the NBA or that the NBA has seen. That Chris Paul was put on the floor by Steph Curry. Curry hit him with a behind-the-back dribble and brought it back the other way, and CP3, he went down, folks. He went down. You might note that part of the reason Paul fell is because he stepped on Curry's foot. I can acknowledge that. I watched the replays. But it's also worth noting that he only stepped on Curry's foot as a result of getting viciously crossed. This is something that we've seen from Curry all year. And, and it's really, really brought up a, a topic that's it's it's hurting some people and it's, and it's affecting some people. Um, you know, everybody wants to know. You know, is Steph Curry the new point guard with the handles in the NBA? And I just want to let everyone know that he's been that, you know, really as, as soon as he emerged into the league. He was doing that at Davidson, but nobody was giving him respect, you know, because of the small school, um, you know, not the big market and things like that. But, you know, if you look at Steph Curry all year, there's actually a play from earlier in the season, not too long ago, where the Clippers played Golden State and the same thing happened um chris paul didn't exactly fall but he has been viciously crossed by steph curry before but i want everyone to know that when you talk about the point guards today we're talking russell we're talking damian lillard and that's what we do on q a like i said we, we give you the sports from a different perspective and i want everyone to know that the new wave of the league is really coming into play um some of these older point guards are leaving and the newer point guards are, are, are really really showing their prowess and showing their mental game and their mental prowess and really elevating their game to you know an all-star level an elite level superstar level um you know the days of the chris pauls chris paul is still you know he's still a clutch point guard he's still a great point guard one of the greatest of all time um 
but you know he's he's also on the end of that list and the end of that tenure um if you look you know in the most recent years the jason kids of the world the steve nashes of the world um you know the chauncey billups of the world there's been some really great point guards but you know there's a really a new wave of athletic point guard that's coming into the league and that you know that's really as a position you can see it all across the league if you look in the west you see steph curry you see damian lillard if you look in the east you see john wall you see um you know bradley beal if you want to talk about those combo guards as well you see kyrie irving um so you know it's the league is really changing and i feel like for the better um you know the players are getting more athletic does it seem like the teams are getting worse? Yes, but at the same time, that's the generational gap that, I tr- that I'm trying to explain to you all right now. Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about you know, the best teams and the best players and all-time best players and things like that. And you can have those discussions, but it depends on what your backup is predicated upon. Because you know, if you look at the league, um, and not just the NBA, the NFL... Um, the MLB is probably the only sport that I can say is, has remained consistent just because the only real negative wave that they have had, um, you know, in their longevity of, you know, being America's pastime is the steroid usage um, in the steroid era and things like that. So, um, you know, when it comes to the NBA, you know, it really irritates me when people say these things, but because I don't think they quite understand, you know, where where you know these points are coming from but it's all about the generation Um, a lot of people have been saying things you know about LeBron James and the move that he made you know to go to Miami to go back to Cleveland and things like that and you know uh, Brian Rappaport was on first take the other day um, one of the shows that I love he's a comedian that I love as well Um, but he said something that I thought was very interesting you know he said that LeBron going to Miami really messed up you know the the shape of the league and the way that you know teams go after players and things like that but I want everyone to know that the only thing that I can fault LeBron James for was you know having that big press conference shutting down ESPN for an entire hour just to hear him say that he was going to go to Miami but at the same time because of the generational gap social media you know the the fans really wanting to be there for every step of the way you know they ESPN or whoever put on or orchestrated you know that had had to do that you know because that's what the people wanted and you know LeBron is the face of the NBA so since he is the face of the NBA you know though that that was what needed to be done um, but on that note alone I can't blame that on LeBron I can't blame that on everybody I can only say and really defend my statement that it's all a di- it's a generational difference if you look back and I've done my research folks I know you're gonna say you you're not that old you haven't been around that long so what do you know any game from the 60s the 70s the 80s the 50s anything that's been recorded folks I can watch and I can study and guess what I have studied if you look back at the LeBron you know not even the LeBron James excuse me the Michael Jordans and the Magic Johnsons, you know, back then it was so natural, and, you know, the the owners back then, they were getting a lot of money, but they weren't getting the money that they're getting nowadays, folks. We have to understand that. The revenue was there, but it's different. You know, you got the season ticket holders, then you got, you know, the, the, the sports team's apps, and the paraphernalia, and the merchandise, and selling tickets, and things like that. There's so much that comes into play nowadays. Um, you know, there's tanking, you know, there's there's so many different increments that really go into an entire season and ownership down to the players the whole the whole hierarchy um so we we need to understand that nowadays the difference is that the players of today's world today's society whatever what have you they only play for themselves um you know you see sometimes with you know Jalil Okafor the Duke player some of the other players um you know they say we're playing for You know, we're playing for the name on the front of the jersey, not on the back of the jersey. When you see things like that, folks, maybe this is just the way that I think. But I find I find things like that very interesting because 
it, it lets me know that these things are trying to be reinforced because of the one and done's, um, you know, because of, you know, you know, people really not spending that much time. You know, if you look at Kyrie Irving, he was injured for most of his freshman and only year. And then he just went to the league. So, you know, a lot of people are upset at that. But at the same time, you have to give these players the opportunity if, you know, they feel like they have the skills or other people feel like they deserve or they have the skills to play at the next level. So I can't significantly blame that on LeBron James. I can't really blame that on anybody. It's something that needs to be understood that as a generation, these players today, you know, they are their agents. There's no need for there's no need for these high powered agents. They still might have them. You know, they still might have them in their repertoire, but they don't use them to the fullest degree because they're their own business, man. They want to make their own money. Um, you know, they want to become that, you know, philanthropist off of the court and make money other ways besides basketball or football, or whatever sport. And that's why you see the commercials. Um, you see the merch. You see the shoe deals. You know, it, it's sometimes I, I find it very interesting, the negative things that people have to say um, about the sports world today when really the same things that are going on now were the same things that were going on back in the former years, the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, whatever, what have you. It's just that the magnitude of issues are different. Um, and, you know, really quickly, I know I'm jumping sports here, but I'll give an example of that with the upcoming Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Manny Pacquiao fight. A lot of people have been saying a lot of negative things about Floyd Mayweather Jr. and some of its antics outside of boxing. Um you know, some of the things that he's gotten in trouble for and, and, you know, how those issues, situations are going to, you know, dictate how he fights in this fight versus Manny Pacquiao and things like that. But, you know, folks, it's no different. Let's not be so quick to, you know, be so hard on Floyd Mayweather or Jameis Winston or any of these guys that you feel like has a negative connotation in the eyes of the media. Um, who really, and I'm only saying this because I guess I've been on both standpoints, you know, my, I have a concentration that's in public relations and I have a minor that's in journalism. So I fully understand where the balance comes from. Um, but, you know, the media platforms and the different and the various media platforms and the media personalities, um, you know, their, their word is law now um, and they've taken over. And I understand that, um, which is why I'm trying to, you know, get this show and get, you know, my persona on on to, I guess, the higher stage, the bigger stage, because if you look at all the sports shows, folks, you don't see anybody from my generation. And that's why I'm saying from sports as a whole, not saying we're not being respected, but I think that, you know, some of the, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to say old because, you know, that's not really a term that I love to use, but you know, some of the past generations look at us kind of in a demeaning nature um, because some of the things that they see on TV, some of the things that they hear on the radio, some things they see on news. Um, but, you know, those same things have been going on. It's just that the situations and the issues are much more bigger now. If you look, and like I, I'll get back to the Floyd Mayweather Jr. example, I apologize. Floyd Mayweather Jr., I'm not, I'm not comparing him to this boxer in any way, folks. I don't want anybody to think that at all. I'm not comparing him in any way. But these same legal situations that Floyd Mayweather is having, any of the situations, you know, with him and his spouse, money, cars, um, you know, 50 cent, all that stuff. I'm not comparing it in any way, folks, but understand the analogy that I'm trying to make. Think of Muhammad Ali back in his prime when, you know, he was fighting, you know, the, the glorious heavyweights that he was fighting, the George Foremans, um, you know, prior to, um, you could even talk Mike Tyson around the, you know, the Buster Douglas time frame, um, where Mike Tyson was really getting a lot of exploits, when he was getting a lot of exploits, um, you know, from the media because of, you know, his dealings with Robin Givens and things like that, you know, Muhammad Ali didn't want to he didn't want to enlist in the draft and that created you know a whole political standpoint and a whole you know negative cloud and a dark cloud over him and that's the same thing that it is with Floyd Mayweather Jr. It, it's no different but only the situation in that 
you know, really the, the time the times are different, and that's all it is. Look at Mike Tyson. Look at the ear biting incident. Look at this. Look at that. Um, you know, all these all these various situations are different in the context of what went on. But overall, when you look at you know these situations as they're thrown into the aggregate or the average or the median, they're all the same thing, and that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. But let me get back to the NBA, folks. You folks, you, you guys got me ranting. I'm getting a lot of questions, um, you know, about just the difference in the generational gaps and things like that. So that's really what not today's show is about, but that's kind of, you know, the overall. Uh, aspect to all the points that I'll be making today. Um, but I made that LeBron James point earlier um, to say that, LeBron, I, I, I don't blame you for whatever madness people feel like is going on in the league now. The players are changing. It's a different generation. So this is what's going to happen. I'm pretty sure that in 15 to 20 years, when the LeBrons of the world are gone, when the Currys and the KDs or however, you know, I hope they lost, they last forever, but however long that they play, there's going to be a new wave of players going into the league. You know, the Andrew Wiggins, the Jabari Parkers, the Okafors, the Carl Anthony Towns, you know, the league is going to change in 20 years. It changes every 15 to 20 years. And that's why there's a gap between when people say, they say Johnson and, and Bird, then they say Magic, uh, I mean, excuse me, then they say Jordan, um, you know, Pippen, Isaiah, whoever they want to say. Then they say Kobe and Shaq, and then they say LeBron and KD. It's it's all a different gap. It's all a, a, a decade gap, 10 to 15 to 20 years. So, you know, Skip Bayless and, and Rappenport that was on the show, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. If I'm not, you know, if he hears it, he'll, he'll probably make a joke or something, but that'll probably get me famous, so that's okay. But, you know, if you look at all these differences – it really, I mean, the gap between the generations, folks, is there for the taking. It's there to be seen. But nobody nobody seems to have their eye open to see it, and that bothers me. It really bothers me. Um, you know, I don't understand how people can make the comments that they make, um, you know, about LeBron and what he's done in the league. Like I said, I don't blame him for being able to come together with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. You know, I only blame him for having that one hour long segment on ESPN that that just that just wrecked my brain. I didn't understand that. But now being older and understanding the politics of sports and things like that, I fully understand, you know, if you're LeBron James and they're going to pay you and they're going to put you on TV for your family and everyone to see you make the decision. You're not going to say no to that. And they're not going to let you say no because you are the face of the league. Do people understand that? Why do you think that you see the I want to be like Mike in these in these Michael Jordan Gatorades commercials from from, you know, 20 years ago and 25 years ago? Do you think that's an accident? No, that's product placement. That's product placement. You know, Michael Jordan's birthday and these anniversaries are rolling around. So they want to show people like, hey, this man, this man changed the game for everyone. He changed it for everyone. He is the reason why LeBron does the things that he does, why KD and these players do the things that they do, and why they sign the shoe deals that they do, and these big, these big major marketing deals, um, you know, the promotions, the product placement, you know, the headphones, you know, all these things are not, they're not just, you know, tossed into a hat and picked out and chosen. No, folks, that's not how it goes. That's just not how it goes, and you need to understand that. Because if you understand that, then you'll be able to appreciate the game better. But you know, most of you all are too busy. Um, and I'm, when I say that, I'm not. I'm not really, you know, talking about my listeners. I'm talking about the listeners that are listening. Um, you know, beyond the listeners. You know, th- those are those are the people that I'm talking about. The ones who, you know, think that they know the game, and they really only know what they saw on the bottom ticker of ESPN this morning. They don't know the game. I know the game, folks. I know I haven't been around that long. I don't have the longevity like everybody else has, but I've done my studying. I've done my research. I have my stats and all my statistics written down in my Carolina Panthers book. Um, if you want to question that, I can I can show you. Um, <laughs> just being a little comical, but seriously, folks, you know this is an issue. Um, you know that that is really really circled you know the entire sports world you know there's so much 
you know, going into play now besides each player's athletics. And what I don't understand is media personalities and different people, they get on the air and they blame the players for these differences and these changes. Folks, nobody is at nobody is to blame. I'm not I don't I'm not singling out anyone. There's nobody to blame. The only thing that you can blame is time. But guess what? Guess what, folks? Time waits for no man. So the league is going to continue the change. The NFL is going to continue to change. Um, with the NFL, it's a little bit slower because you're starting to see these players with longevity really stick around and still, you know, still winning. You know, Peyton Manning, even though he didn't do exactly, you know, the best that he's done. Um, you know, this past year, I don't get on him as hard as most people do because I tell people all the time, you know, I played football from, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade, high school, freshman year in college. I got redshirted and that was it. But guess what, folks? Still today, I'm athletic. I keep my cleats and my basketball shoes in my trunk. We can go at it whenever. If you call me out, we can ball. But guess what? I still feel the effects from that right, you know, today. So when people get on Peyton Manning and they get on these players and they say these players are declining and things like that, I tell them, you put on some pads and you go against, you know, some 300, 300 plus linemen who are running faster 40s than Jameis Winston. And you, and you put on some pads and you play 18, 19 years in the National Football League. Get out of here. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And sometimes it's, you know, I'm not just saying the older generations. It's my generation as well. But that's when it comes with the generational gap. The old heads know what they're talking about. You know, they were around to see it. They might not know what they're talking about in today's world. But that's probably because, you know, you know, they don't have the premium channels and they don't have a computer. Some of the necessary things that you kind of need to get to get that connection. But, you know, me, folks, I'm ahead of the curve. I've done my research. Um, you know, my grandmother is who, you know, put me on, you know, understanding sports from a different and a more intu you know, intuitive level, um, you know, because that's who she is. And, you know, shout out to Eunice Gillum. I love you. Um, you you're the original, you know, you, you, you're Stephen A. and Skip and all those guys before I even knew who those guys were. Um, so, you know, it, it's about the research that you do and how you look at the game. I look at the game from a deeper, you know, deeper perspective. And that's why I wanted to create this show, you know, to be able to kind of not maybe average out, but, you know, put together really the common denominators and the status quo for how my generation looks at sports today, because it's different. You know, there's different things that come into play. Like I said, there's social media, um, there's different media platforms. Um, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, just getting back to the basketball references, you know, talking about Cleveland and how well they can do, um, you know, this season. And if they match up against Miami, this is going to happen. They, you know, they hope they lose and this and that because of how he did Miami. How he did Miami, he's a businessman. He's a businessman. So, you know, when you get to the higher prowess where you can make power moves and do things like that and put people in a place to be successful and to get them money and things like that and make your family more prosperous, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit and, you know, do the same things that you've been doing? Or if there's opportunities to prosper, are you going to prosper? Or are you going to be so, you know, wound up and confined into what you're doing right now that you can't, you know, further yourself into the future? And anyone that says that they're going to do that, that's hogwash. <laughs> that's a word my grandma uses. I just thought it was funny to use. I, another word popped into my head, but it's not exactly, uh, you know, the best for the airwaves. But, you know, I, I just want everybody to understand that you cannot be so hard on these athletes. You just can't. And they might give you a reason to talk about them. And you talk about them because that's your job but after that you have to let it go um you know just to get on the football aspect a lot of people are discussing Jameis Winston and his meet you know his reasonings behind not going to the NFL draft and my response to that is Jameis shouldn't have to explain to anybody why he's not going to the NFL draft the NFL you know keeps showcasing and putting on ESPN that he's not going to the draft because they're losing money because of that do you get what I'm saying folks that's why they want him there so the Florida State fans can pay money to come from Florida State and Tallahassee to New York to see him get drafted. Do you get what I'm saying? Is this all making sense? 
Oh, excuse me. It's in Chicago this year. My apologies. So sorry, Chicago people. I know how it is out there. Do not come for me. I'm so sorry. But um, you you got you have to understand. You know, Jameis Winston deciding to do what he did is the reason why Marcus Mariota has come out today or yesterday and said that he's not going to go to the draft either. But he needed to see somebody at a, I guess, a higher power or more, you know, more popularity or a bigger athlete or whatever the case may be. He needed to see somebody of that stature make the move first so he can feel comfortable within himself to make the decision. And that is sad, folks. That's sad that he had to wait. And that's sad that he wasn't comfortable enough with the system that he didn't need to go to the draft because he wanted to be with his family. When I saw the ticker and I did my research and I saw Jameis Winston's direct quotes and it said that he wasn't going to the draft because he wanted to be with his ill grandmother that cannot travel because of health reasons. Jameis, I totally understand you, brother. My great-grandmother is 96. She's in Greenville, South Carolina, and I know she can't come to my graduation, but the first thing that I'm going to do is go to Greenville to show her, bring the graduation to her. And that's what he's doing. So people saying all these things about he needs to be there and he has to be there. He's the first overall pick. He doesn't have to do anything. You're only saying that he needs to be there because without him being there, you're losing a story. Then you're losing revenue. This stuff really gets me riled up, folks, because people aren't looking at it like this, and I don't understand why. And it's okay to not look at it like this, but when you don't look at it like this, and then you have negative things to say, oh, man. I think this is a direct quote from, remember the Titans, you're overcooking my grits, coach. You really are. I don't understand it. Why should this man have to come out and fully explain why he doesn't want to go to the draft? He shouldn't have to. He shouldn't have to. He should not have to. You know, some of these other players, a lot of things, you know, have been, you know, discussed, you know, with the linebacker uh, that had, you know, po- you know, I mean, I don't really want to get into that on this show, but tested positive for some things prior to the draft. And now people are wondering where his draft stock is going to rise. Is it going to drop? Things like that. And, you know, I I fully understand that if you mess up, you know, you shouldn't get the chances, things like that, unless people are willing to give you a second chance, which everybody deserves a second chance. Um, we're in the United States of America. Let's not be oblivious to that. But at the same time, you know, it, it I just don't understand how we're going to say now that somebody goes from, you know, a top 10 pick, you know, to not getting drafted at all you know because you know because of a positive testing which i understand but i mean good gracious folks is that is that how we've gotten but guess what and i'm going to hit you with some more information that you're going to be like really but you know if you look back you know during the times uh, i want to get i want to make sure i'm getting this right i don't i really don't want to mess this up I really don't want to mess this up because this is this is a quote, this is an analogy, you know that, you know I really, I really want to get right. I really want to get this right. Okay, okay, yep, okay. I just want to make sure I'm getting it right, and I am, folks. I've done my research. I have it up. The same things that you're doing now, in the same ways that the media, you know, really punishes these players and criticizes them. And crucifies, you know, they, they crucify them before they even step on the field is the same thing that Mr. Joseph McCarthy did. I know I'm making a I know I'm making a history reference here, but it's the same thing Mr. McCarthy did, you know, during the times of World War when he was, you know, accusing people of communism. And, you know, as an entire society, the world was just like condemning these people because of what one man was saying. And we do that today, but we do it. We do it in the sports realm. We do it in the sports realm, and I just I can't contemplate why, you know, we are still doing those things. You know, people are still, I mean, I heard Skip Bayless, you know, today and yesterday still talk about Jameis Winston and the crab leg incident. You have to let some of those things go. Because, I mean, I have my laptop in front of me, and I can get on here, and I can type in what has Skip Bayless done in his entire life. And guess what, folks? I can bet you that there's some things that are, are not on there that maybe probably should be. 
So, you know, let's just not be so quick to get on these players, whether it be LeBron or Jameis, you know, from any standpoint. You know, let's just not be so quick, you know, to to get on them, you know, when, you know, it, it's it's really no reason to. It's really no reason to. But really quickly, folks, I just want to let everyone know that if you didn't know, you are listening to Q&A on WCCU Radio, Coastal Carolina University's student radio station. And now you know. You know, it, it's really interesting, folks, you know, when you look into – I want to get into this topic because this is something that's really intrigued me. Um, who are the best coaches, you know, the best college coaches left in the Final Four right now? Um, you know, Izzo, Bo Ryan, Coach Calipari, Coach K. You know, that's really, really, really interesting, folks. That's an interesting conversation. Um, you know, oh, man. It's hard to say because each of these coaches, you know, in a different way, they really do different things. You know, it's different when you look at Coach Izzo in the Michigan State Spartans because, you know, it's almost like he turns them up, you know, when it when it when it comes time to March Madness. And I love that about his team. You know, however, you know, however they look during the season, they always stay together. You know, they might have some key injuries or they might lose a player or two. You never know. But Izzo seems to always get them on the same page and has them, you know, really collaborating and really extremely cohesive when it comes to March Madness time. And, you know, that's that's why, you know, they're in the position, you know, that they're in right now. Um, You know, even Bo Ryan, you know, Bo Ryan is a coach that I really respect. And I don't think that he gets talked about a whole lot just because, you know, I think people really look at Wisconsin as being kind of a boring team, I guess. I mean, I'm someone who, you know, not necessarily used to think like that, but, you know, they weren't a team that I always watched the entire game because sometimes it would just be such a slow game. But then I had to realize as I got older that that's a part of Bo Ryan's craft to keep the game tight, um, you know, to keep the possessions in Wisconsin's hands, to first, you know, force turnovers um, and really, you know, have the, you know, really you know, I guess points per possession always be in their favor. Um, but it really quickly, not saying I'll let you decide, but, you know, these are the, the I guess, the statistics that go into, you know, making, you know, making that, that reference. Tom Izzo is 494 and 198. That's a winning percentage of 71.4. Um, you know, we know what Coach K can do, um, you know, overall in college. Um you know, his head coaching record is 1,016 and 310. You know, that's, you know, I could easily say that Coach K is the best of all of them. And, I mean, he, when it comes to winning and everything, and, I mean, coaching, you know, Team USA, you know, he really has the stats to back it up. You can easily say, you know, that he's the best. He develops players and things like that. But, you know, we also need to understand, and people get on Coach, you know, Calipari about this a lot, when they say that, you know, he – you know, he can't um, develop his players. Willie Colley Stein is, is an example of that that I use all the time, and I'm going to continue to use it because I think it's just a phenomenal example. Willie Colley Stein, when he first got to Kentucky, it was somebody, you know, he wasn't even exactly a premier shot blocker. Um, he had no post moves. You know, he could catch an alley oop, and that's about it. You know, he was still tall enough to shot block you seven foot, but he was fouling on a lot of those fouls. He was fouling out a lot. Um, you know, he was really getting outplayed, um, you know, by some of the players that have gone into the league now. Um, you know, so, you know, now he's on the Wooden, you know, he's on the Wooden's finalist list. You know, for somebody whose PPG is not exactly the best, um, you know, but he's he's the reason, you know, why, you know, he's the reason why Kentucky is where they are. You know, I mean, I can't I can't deny that. I cannot deny that. You know, if you look at his numbers, you know, over the years, you know, it, every year, it, I mean, it, it's he's just doing more for his team. You know, he's doing more for his team each year. You know, his minutes played in 2012-2013 was 683. In 2013-2014, it was 880. This year, it's 979. You know, some of those things you just – 
you just can't teach. You know, you can't teach those things. Those are things that, you know, you have to, you have to let, you know, your players, you know, and I've noticed this, and that's why, you know, it's funny when you look at the differences between those coaches because I can say significantly that Tom Izzo, Coach Cal, and Coach K are all coaches that are coached by their players, if that makes sense to you. Um, their player, you know, their coaches that let their players be great. Um, they put systems into play that they can execute, and then they let them execute them. You know, it, because that's what they're brought there to do. Um, you know, so if you look at, you know, and I'm just using Willie Colley Sander as an example. You know, his for his career, you know, 104 games, 8.1 points per game, 6.3 rebounds per game, 0.9, so pretty much one assist per game. But you know, at seven foot two forty, you can't tell me that he's not a reason why Kentucky's doing what they're doing. You can't say that at all. Um, so you know, really, and I'll, I'll get to I'll give you, you know, Coach Bo Ryan, who's a phenomenal coach at Wisconsin. His overall is seven thirty nine and two twenty seven. Um, so he has a seventy six point percent winning percentage, which isn't bad at all. Um, you know, Coach Calipari, Memphis vacated those wins. And, you know, when I first heard about that, I put that in the category, I guess, where, you know, Jim Beheim is now, UConn with their sanctions, um, you know, University of Southern California, even with Reggie Bush and the sanctions that he put on him, pretty much made him forego the Heisman Trophy that he won. Um, you know, if you don't... If, <sighs> I don't know, folks. When it comes to these sanctions and things like that, that's a whole another topic in itself, because you know, and that that's also a generational gap. That that's also a generational gap. And let me and let me tell you why. I know I'm. I know you feel like I'm rambling. I'm going all around, but I'm really making one big point. If you're really listening to what I'm saying, you know. Some of these things that have gone on with Jim Beheim and some of these other coaches who are being, you know, persecuted, and the programs that are being persecuted. Um, I even heard about my program, North Carolina. You know, I know there was some investigations going on, but you know, they're probably going to possibly be getting, you know, sanctions for their institution coming up. And it interests me because sometimes when I look back at the stories and the situations that they talk about, they don't exactly all have the best information provided to really look at what has gone on. But at the same time, some of these things have happened years ago. But the generational gap is that they happened years ago. But because it's so much of a social thing now, because of these different social, you know, aspects and Facebook and, you know, the ESPN Go app and, you know, watch ESPN and all these various things and LeBron James's Instagram and all these various ways that you can get in touch with the players, you know, because of that. Now, you know, the information of the people that can, you know, place these sanctions and get people in trouble, they're like, you know what, what better time than now? What better time than now? It's so much craziness going on, and it's so easy to get information out there. Let's just wait a few more years. Let's wait a few more years. And that's when I read about the information about Syracuse and Jim Beheim, I totally feel Jim Beheim. I feel him 100%. Because you waited until towards the end of the season when those players still had games to go conference tournament whatever regular season I think it was a few more games two three four games left in the regular season you decided to put that information out there how dare you how dare you because even if you don't have respect for Syracuse in the orange have respect for those players have respect for the players man have respect for them Sitting in the studio right now is a good friend of mine, Mr. Nico Ross. He writes for the Coastal Carolina University Chanticleer's newspaper. And he is an athlete here at Coastal Carolina University as well on the football team. Playing on the defensive side of the ball, of course. Real hitters. But the thing is, folks... He's in the studio right now because he's interviewing me and he's putting and he's writing a segment about me and some other, you know, powerful, you know, and influential students on campus and putting it into his paper. But guess what he, you know, he has to do after he does that? Still has to go to workouts, even though he's graduating with me in just a few weeks. 
still has to go to work out, still has to be a part of the team, still has to wake up at 5 and 6 and 4 o'clock in the morning. But people don't respect his craft. They don't respect what he's doing. What is, I don't, And I don't understand that. I don't understand that, man. I know you're not attacking my man, Mr. Ross, here, folks, listeners. I know you're not. I know you're not. Let me take the aggression out of my voice. I'm just saying overall, when we look at these student athletes, you know, there's some institutions where people are just getting pushed through and they're just getting eased through. I've had class with this man and other people. I know how they work. They put in work. Walking around sleepy and tired. Because they got a job. They got two jobs. They got the real job. Then you got the job for the newspaper. Then you got the job being an athlete. Good Lord. No free time. So, folks, let's not be so hard on these athletes from this level all the way to the top. Because the same situation that these players are going through now, they were going through them before. But before, y'all didn't care. You all didn't care. But now that some of these issues have gone out, you know, now you all care. And really quickly, I want to touch on this because this is something that me and my grandmother are talking about just to get on the NFL aspect. And not just the NFL because this is this is a problem with, you know, with all sports. But it, it's just come out in the eyes of the NFL in the past year. But a lot of people have been saying a lot of you know things about the domestic violence issue. I'm not going to speak on that for long, folks, because you know I don't even like talking about things like that on this show. But let's be real, folks. And this is something that Eunice brought up to me. No, I don't call my grandmother by her first name. That's just something I did just now. I don't want, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm still a standard Southern. I wouldn't do that. But you know, like me and her came to the conclusion too. This has been going on for decades, years, years on top of years on top of years, on top of years. But now people are just now starting to get caught. So now it's an issue. And now they're like, let's bring light to this issue and this situation and this and that and this and that. Huh? Not saying it's too late, better late than never. But you act like we've never seen this stuff before. I mean, I talked about the Mike Tyson, the Mike Tyson incident. I know that's boxing, but come on. So when Floyd does the things that he does and you say, well, we've never seen these before and we've never seen these type of antics. Muhammad Ali is the reason why Mike Tyson and Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Sugar Shane Mosley and Sugar Ray Leonard and Bernard Hopkins and Jermaine Taylor. I mean, folks, Roy Jones Jr. I, I, oh, my gosh, I know I know what I'm talking about. Oh man, I know what I'm talking about. Muhammad Ali created this with these with these boxers, and and, and Michael Jordan, and some of these other greats. I'm, real quick, I just want to stay on this Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali kick, because it, it, it seems like this is the only way people really understand me when I talk about some of the greats. They are the reason why these players act, and they are the businessmen, and these athletes are the businessmen, and trying to get money and revenue and merch and promotions and shoe deals and and you know be in commercials and things like that they they're the reason that that happened because they're the ones that created the variations in athletics when it came to you as a person then you on the court or on the field feel me for a second folks really take in what I'm saying it's you as a person it's me Addison Taylor and then it's number 19 you know for the Irmo Yellow Jackets or the Charleston Southern Buccaneers and then it's the persona. Then it's the persona. Then it's the persona. Where you get into, you know, my favorite receiver in high school is Chad Johnson. And I know you people are like, Addison, I don't know what kind of receiver you were. I wasn't the best, but I was pretty good. It was honorable mention. You know what I mean? So, and I've talked about Nico with this before because, you know, some of our family is from the same area. Shout out to Greenville. Shout out to the upstate. That's where pretty much half of my family's from. But I grew up watching my older cousins play because they had that persona. And where do you think they got that from? They didn't just wake up one day and have it. They got that from the former athletes. I love Chad Johnson because, and this is in his prime when he was pro bowling and 1,000-yard receiving every year. I mean, this man had a list, folks. He had a list of all the cornerbacks, all the number one cornerbacks in the league, and he put it in his locker. And then after that, he'd write down the stats that he'd have against those cornerbacks. I loved it. 
people hated it, but I loved his persona. I loved it because he could back it up. Where do you think he? Where do you think these players are getting that from? Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali, amongst other players, created this, folks. They created this. I mean, Babe Ruth. You know, Mickey Harrison. I mean, I. I mean, Jack Nicholson. You know, I mean, I could. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. What, what do you want me to say? They created that. Where you also you have to have that player, and then you have to have the persona. You have to have the persona. So when people say, well, Floyd's mouth's got him in trouble, that's been happening for years, folks. Have you ever watched the Muhammad Ali interview? If you haven't, you need to go on YouTube and you need to do so. You really need to do so so you can be enlightened. Because that man was fierce and he was nasty, but he had to. Not necessarily because he was nasty as a person, but because that boxing persona, him in that ring, Muhammad Ali in that ring, was different from Cassius Clay. He wasn't Cassius Clay, which is why he created the persona of Muhammad Ali. Do y'all get what I'm saying? Golly, man. I don't think you hear me. This is serious. If you look at sports this way, folks, you'll have a deeper understanding and appreciation for all sports. And that's why I cover all sports, and I love them all. Because I look at things deep like this. I look at, I look at the entire world like this. But with sports, it's so deep. It runs so deep. Because there's a political side, there's a business side, there's a player side. You know, I mean, even with, you know, like I brought up in the beginning of the segment with the, you know, the Stephen Curry, you know, crossing up Chris Paul and, you know, people saying, you know, Chris Paul is still better than Steph Curry. And then, no, 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 no. Yeah, Chris Paul is a better, you know, facilitator, and he can get to any spot he wants to on the court. But, I mean, so can Steph Curry, man. Good Lord. And he could jack up the shots, too. He's, he has a way better shot than Chris Paul. Chris Paul wishes he could shoot like Steph Curry. And so does 98.9% of the league. I mean, we told you, man. We told you on this show when I had, uh, you know, Lord Helix, Chase McFadden on. We told you the numbers. I mean, Curry might, for the season... 50, 40, and 90? Or it might be 40 and 50 and 90. I I apologize, but both of those are high, folks. Field goal percentage, three-point percentage, free throw percentage? Come on, man. I'm flabbergasted that you don't understand what I'm saying. It's just time. Don't be so dumbfounded by the cross-up or by these, you know, by these you know, situations, Jameis not wanting to go, LeBron getting blamed. The only thing LeBron James should be looked at right now is, is the Cleveland Cavaliers. Can they beat Miami in a given, in a seven game series? Excuse me. I'm willing to probably say yes. Could they beat the Hawks? Probably yes. But at the same time, I'm not just going to give them the title because LeBron James is on there because I know how hard it is to play with LeBron James. And I know you're like, Addison, you've never played with LeBron James. I know I have a news flash, but I know how great he is. I've been watching him since he came into the league. This man was in high school with a jersey out. That's the difference in generation. That's the that that's another prime example right there. Understand it. The reason why I'm not giving Cleveland so much not credit, but you know, LeBron should be in the MVP race. I mean, he's the greatest right now. He's the greatest, and he can go down as one of the overall greatest. Nobody can do what he does at his size. So when Skip Bayless and you know even Stephen A. Smith and Michael Wilbon and some of these other people that are hard that, are, that have been hard on LeBron, I don't want to condemn them, but that have been hard on LeBron for not doing this and not doing that and missing his free throws and not being clutch, think of how hard it must be to play with this man. And that's why I'm so proud of how well Cleveland's done. And that's why I was so surprised at Miami winning the championships that they did. So when LeBron said not six, not seven, not eight, not nine, I wasn't thinking in my head like, no, dude, you can't do that. I was thinking in my head like, no, dude, they can't do that with you because you're the greatest. And everybody's like, well, Addison, if he's the greatest, then, then why can't they do it? Because, folks, you have to understand the game. You have to understand that LeBron takes away Kyrie Irving. He takes away what Kyrie can do because he can do everything Kyrie can do. He can't handle the ball like Kyrie. I'm not saying that. Let's not jump the gun. Don't don't kill me. I know what I'm saying here. 
But as far as being a point guard and bringing the ball up the court and fighting off defenders, he can do what the point guard can do. He can slash and pass like a shooting guard. He can post up and rebound like a small forward. He drives the lane and, 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 and really clogs holes up in the lane like a power forward. And he can guard your big man and your power forward and center like a center. Come on, man. Gee, golly. I don't think you folks hear me. I don't think you understand what I'm saying. That's why it's so hard. And that's why, you know, when people are downing LeBron, I'm not downing him. I'm bigging him up. And I'm bigging up the other players that he's playing with. Because you see Kevin Love's numbers decrease. Kyrie's numbers have even, has, have even decreased. He's had the 55-point games and things like that, but, you know, that's because him and LeBron are becoming more cohesive and LeBron is trusting Kyrie more to do what he does. But as far as trusting Kevin Love, that's not even a position that can really be really brought up because Kevin Love can't sit in that post and ask for the ball on the block. Why? Because that hole and that block and that in that lane is for LeBron to drive and do what he does. Because he's the best player. Do you get what I'm saying? Do you really understand what I'm saying? It's hard. It's hard playing with the best. It's hard playing with the best. And that's the difference between Michael and Kobe. Kobe's on that list, but I even put LeBron over Kobe when it comes to let me finish, folks. Let me finish. Because you know when you throw Kobe, Michael, and LeBron in the same sentence, people start to come after your mothers. I'm not making the comparison. I'm not making the comparison. No, no, no. You're not going to make me. But when it comes to making people better, LeBron has definitely made people more better than Kobe has. Yes, he has. You can say what you want to say. You can say what you want to say. I know about the dynasty. But guess what? Robert Horry already had a ring. D. Fish had been in the league. Knows what it, knows what it takes. The team that they assembled with, you know, Carl Malone and it. Come on, man. Pal Gasol. Come on, man. He had one overseas. He knew how to win. I'm not saying he didn't make them better. But, you know, I mean, from start to finish, LeBron has always been a distributor. He has always been a distributor, and he's always been someone who can do everything. So that's why it's hard to play with him. To play with him, you're going to have to sacrifice. Because both of you can do what both of you can do. But the thing is, in the common denominator is, folks, who does it better, and who does it at a more consistently high level every night? LeBron James. I mean... Come on, man. But there's also some generational gaps that sometimes will play better more for the past than the present, and I understand that as well. That could be seen in the NFL. When some people are quickly to call, you know, you know, I heard somebody the other day said, you know, told me they said Addison Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson is the greatest quarterback of all time. Sorry, I had to take my headphones off and realize that I even said that. You don't know the game. Yeah, he has a Super Bowl ring. He could go down as one of the greatest of all time. But, man, give him some time. That's what I say about Andrew Luck. Give him some time. Let him show you. You, you, you Folks, you don't, you don't give people a chance to even show you. You have these preconceived notions before you know they even make moves on the field. So then when they mess up. You're like, I told you so. I told you so. No. Everybody hyped up and said all this stuff about Johnny Manziel and what he did off the, you know, what he was doing off the field and his party and his stuff like that. Him not transitioning to the NFL well had nothing to do with that. His game just didn't translate. We've seen it before. Tim Tebow. Had nothing to do with the drinking and the going out and partying and being in Vegas. His game didn't translate. In college, he could jump over people and, you know, throw the ball up in the air. And Michael come down with it. 
Mike's playing for the Buccaneers now. He's excellent, number 13. Um, but, you know, he can't do that in the NFL. Not when you have offensive linemen and it really defensive linemen, I guess when I'm talking about him being a quarterback, when you have defensive linemen and linebackers who run in the same 40 as I do. Sub 5-5. Five, five. Four five, excuse me, five five. Good lord, never ran anything like that. Um, you know, sub four four. I mean, come on. His game didn't translate. So, you know, let's not. Oh well, when Manziel gets out of, you know, the re- rehabilitation that he's in, um, we're gonna handle his career delicately, and you know, we're hoping that he evolves into the player. No, you got to run a system that does what he can do. That's what I give so much respect to Coach Eric Spolstra from Miami because in the first couple of years, he didn't really know what he was doing. He was kind of learning on the whim. But once he started to develop some plays and stuff, some things that he could run with those three great players that he had, he became a mastermind. Coach Blatt still has opportunity to do that with Cleveland. But let's just not be so hard on LeBron and some of these other players. Let's just be hard on the Cleveland Cavaliers. Let's understand that they're a defensive liability. I completely understand that, and that's why I don't want to give them the title because I don't know how they're going to act on the defensive end. But they've shown me spurts that they can do right. I went to New Orleans for spring break, and we sat in Harris uh, Harris Casino. Um, I wasn't betting. I wasn't betting a lot, Mama. But we were in Harris Casino, and you know we were really sitting and watching that Spurs Cavs game. As you know, the Cavs really took over and went into overtime. They played a really good defensive game. When Cleveland played the Memphis Grizzlies a few weeks back, it's maybe about a week or two ago. Um, about a week ago, I, I you know I I really when I saw the 117 to 89 score, whatever it was, you know I was really really surprised. I was like, oh my gosh, Cleveland is really taking that next step. They really taking that next step. So, on that aspect, folks, as we're starting to wind down, three minutes left, half class at one. I really hope everyone took in, you know, what I said today, and really understood where I was coming from. Um, I know you might feel, um, you know, like you didn't get the topics of the day or things like that um but i I actually kind of threw them in there um i just kind of kind of slid them under some undertones um they were just covered up by some of i guess every other thing i was saying but you know this is serious folks and you know this is this is um you know why i'm trying to do uh what i'm doing and, and why i want to because i feel like there's a place for it there really is a place for it you know, I watch these sports shows and I see the comments that they make and they're just so generic. They're so generic. And I and I think, you know, wow, you know, we got it. We, we got it. We have to get our generation's perspective out there somehow. We have to get it out there somehow. It, it, I mean, whether it's not being respected or not being showcased or displayed, we have to get it out there. We have to. We have to. Um, and you know, I want to be the man to do it. So on that aspect, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, I want to thank Nico for sitting in with me. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you doing what you do, man. I respect you. Um, 10 million percent, man. We got a couple more weeks to go. Um, folks, we graduate in a few weeks. I don't know. I just, my teacher wanted me to do that. So I did it. But, um, on that aspect, folks, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I want to thank you for tuning in, however you tuned in, wherever, why ever, anything. I appreciate you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Hope you enjoy your week. It's been a beautiful week. The sun has been out. Enjoy it and spend time with your loved ones. If you're on spring break or if you're breaking or vacationing, be safe. Um, and once again, I just wanted to quickly throw this out um, for Miss Barbara back at Carolina Roadhouse because. She's from Buffalo, and I might come into work, you know, tonight, and she might swing on me. So, Carolina Roadhouse is having a yard slash bake sale this Saturday, folks. This Saturday, April 4th, 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. All proceeds will go to Relay for Life. That's Carolina Roadhouse, 
4617 North Kings Highway, Myrtle Beach, 48th Ave, whatever you want to say. And on, on, on that note, folks, I just want to say be blessed, God bless, have faith, enjoy the rest of your day. This is Addison Taylor from Q&A signing out.